Okay, so uh, today's uh, talk is on quantitative uh, structure activity relationship, a few validation methods and software tools developed at the DTC laboratory. So basically, I will discuss here some of the tools uh, developed in our laboratory, uh, which are for QACR model development and validation. So before we go to tools, I will discuss uh, the basics of uh, QSL. So QSL is an acronym of Quantitative Structure Activity Relationship. This is basically a statistical approach of modeling biological activity, which may be either therapeutic or toxic of various kinds of chemicals, including drugs, toxicants, environmental pollutants, etc., using descriptors, which are representative of molecular structure and or their property. So as we know, uh, molecular structure representation uh, basically depict uh, some structural information in a visual way. So there should be some method of converting this visual information into numerical form of information and this numeric information is descriptor the descriptors encode information that is present in molecular structure in numerical form they can also encode uh, different information with regard to the physiochemical property of a chemical now descriptors can be derived either based on a physiochemical experiment or they can be computed based on different algorithm and different levels of theory. So all QSL models are basically based on the assumption that the biological activity is a function of chemical structure and or property. That means the biological activity is a function of descriptors. Now, instead of biological activity, we can also use different property values of chemicals or we can use also different toxicity values as the response. So in that case, it will be termed as QSPR, that means quantitative structure property relationship or quantitative structure toxicity relationship or QSTR, depending on the kind of the response. In brief, if we express any QSA relationship in the form of any equation, then in the left hand side we get the response that is the biological activity or toxicity or property that we are modeling and in the right hand side will be the structural information or information about their properties in the form of numbers which are called descriptors now if we see some simple structures of a particular chemical class here i have given examples of uh, phenothiazines. Now the first example is actually chlorpromazine, the second example is promethazine, and the third one is ethopropazine. Now the first one, uh, the chlorpromazine is uh, actually anti-psychotic compound, promethazine is an anti-histaminic compound, and ethopropazine is an anti-Parkinsonian compound. Now you can see all of these compounds have their same uh, core nucleus, only they differ in the substituents and side chains. So it's small changes in structural features, we can change their uh, pharmacological category. In this way, with changes in structure, there may be changes in the duration of action, there may be changes in the magnitude of action. So these kind of changes in biological activity, which changes in chemical structure occur in a very systematic way. And QS here tries to uh, capture that relationship, how the, there is a change in biological activity which changes in the chemical structure pattern or changes in the properties or features. So that uh, relationship is captured in a mathematical way so that a quantitative relationship can be developed, which can then be used for predictive purpose, for new set of chemicals, 
which have not been used in the development of the model so that they can be predicted even before their synthesis. And in that way, we can have some data about that particular response, uh, whether the uh, particular query chemical will have activity or toxicity or any other property in the higher range or lower range. And then depending on our uh, requirement, we can select appropriate compound for further synthesis and experimental testing. So as I have already mentioned that this kind of relationship between molecular structure and changes in biological activity in a quantitative fashion is the center of focus for the field of QSR. QSR encompasses both the structure activity and structure property relationship. And it is an intellectual exercise of assembling, manipulating, examining data obtained from physical, chemical, biological, and computational experiments. And finally, we apply statistical modeling approaches to correlate biological activity or property uh, to the descriptors or uh, numerical information about molecular structure and their property using chemometric tools. And as I've already mentioned that uh, the basic notion is the model response is a function of chemical structure and our property. Now, uh, the job of a QSM modeler is to identify the important feature for a particular response. Because with the availability of a different uh, descriptor computing software, one can uh, compute thousands of descriptors for a particular chemical structure. But one should have a clear idea about which kind of features or which kind of uh, structural information or descriptors will be important for a particular kind of response. So QSR is a ligand-based approach. So we have to start with the molecular structure representation and we have to compute molecular descriptors using some predetermined algorithm. And there may be different uh, uh, levels of uh, uh, computation of uh, descriptors. It may be simple uh, 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 0D or 1D, it may be 2D, it may be 3D, it may be higher dimensional as I'll discuss in next slides. And then we have to apply appropriate feature selection tool to identify which kind of features are important for the particular response that is being going to be modeled. And we have to then apply appropriate uh, regression or classification based algorithm to develop a model so that the uh, derived quantitative relationship can be used to calculate the uh, biological activity of the compounds. And in case of the training set compound, that means the compounds which are used for development of the model, after development of the model, we can compute those, uh, uh, those uh, compounds uh, using descriptor values, and we can then compare how the calculated value, uh, calculated values of those compounds differ from the observed or experimental ones. And obviously for a good model, the deviation between the observed and experimental values should be low. And once we are satisfied that the derived model is able to perform the uh, computation in a satisfactory manner, then we can apply this model for a new set of chemicals. Now the question comes, when we will go for regression based for, uh, modeling and when we will go for classification based model. Now, when we have continuous values of the responses, uh, that means we have uh, the quantitative values of responses in a continuous scale, then we can go for regression-based modeling. And such kind of modeling will be able to predict the uh, response values precisely. But in some cases, we may not have the exact values of uh, the response. We may have some uh, graded uh, uh, response values. That means some um, compounds may be active or some compounds may be inactive, some compounds may be higher toxic, some compounds may be lower toxic. So in such cases, we can go uh, for classification-based modeling. That means the descriptor values will be quantitative, but the response values are of graded nature, like it may be of binary type, one and zero, 
or yes and, or, and no. So depending on the response uh, data available and also depending on the purpose of the modeling, we can go either for regression or for classification. So we are starting from appropriate uh, molecular structure representation and from the structural representation, we can compute descriptor values. Now, in the simplest sense, say if we uh, consider this structure, say this is naphthalene. Now, if we say how many carbon atoms are present in this uh, compound, how many hydrogens are present, how many double bonds are present, whether the component is aromatic or not, or some property, say what is the log p value of this compound, or any other uh, uh, property. So, all these can be descriptors. But descriptors can be computed at higher levels also. So, but that depends whether our response demands higher levels of theory or not, or whether we can use simple two-dimensional information of the molecular structure to go for modeling. So that depends on the kind of response that we are dealing with and also diversity in the data set. Now, if we have a series of compounds having only some substituents, uh, uh, say alkyl substituents in this naphthalene nucleus, and that uh, alkyl substituents may uh, uh, differ from uh, one from each other in the way of branching, say. So in that case, we do not need uh, to compute any higher dimensional descriptor. We may use some simple branching indices, which are available in 2D. So that depends on the uh, kind of uh, data set that we are dealing with. And, uh, and the type of response, whether the response is dependent on the uh, stereochemical specificity or not. So depending on those uh, uh, considerations, we have to uh, uh, choose appropriate uh, uh, level of theory for descriptor competition. Now, after we have derived our descriptor, so we'll have so many columns. As I have told that there are several descriptor computing software, so we may have thousands of descriptors. So we have to know which, uh, info, which kind of information or which kind of features would be important for a particular kind of response. And for that, we need to apply some feature selection tool. But before applying feature selection tool, we may have to apply uh, other uh, additional tools to uh, curate our QSA table because some of the columns may have uh, all the same values, that is no variance in those columns. Uh, and some of the columns may be highly intercorrelated. Say the two columns are carrying similar type of information there, so they are highly intercorrelated and may thus be redundant. So we have to uh, actually do the descriptor thinning fast by removing highly intercorrelated descriptors and uh, the descriptors uh, which do not show any variance in their columns. And in that way, we can do descriptor matrix theme. And then we can apply uh, appropriate uh, feature selection tool. And then we can apply appropriate uh, classification or regression algorithm to develop our, our model. And after we develop our model, the model will be able to calculate the response of the training compounds and also for some new compounds, provided that you submit uh, the uh, same uh, descriptor value, that is the same descriptor combination that have been used in the model generation. But one should be sure that the model that has been developed is robust enough and statistically sound and acceptable so that it can be used for prediction of new set of chemicals. And for that, we have to apply some statistical test to know their statistical robustness and soundness and not only that, we have to see then whether the model is able to predict the response of the new query compounds. That means predictability of the model. Now, this cannot be uh, uh, obtained or should not be obtained from the training set compounds because the training set compounds have been used to develop the model. So we should apply some new set of chemicals to know their uh, predicted value from the model developed. And then we can compare the predicted values with the observed or experimental ones to judge whether the model is able to compute or predict the response.
for the quake compounds precisely. And that's why each model will have its own applicability domain for prediction of new query chemicals. And before applying a model for prediction of new query chemicals, one must go for the test of applicability domain, and which is actually based on the structural features of the training set compounds. In some cases, also the response values may be considered in defining applicability domain of the model developed. Once we are satisfied with the quality and predictive ability of the model, then the model is ready for prediction purpose. And the model can also have diagnostic value. It can be used for mechanistic interpretation of the response, particular kind of response being modeled. Well, that means it can be used to explore the mechanistic aspect of the uh, biological activity or some enzyme inhibition or receptor blocking that we are modeling. And uh, then it can be used to design new set of chemicals because now we'll have some information which kind of features will increase uh, biological activity or decrease toxicity. And using those kind of information, we can do molecular engineering to make changes in the molecular structure so, so that we can find an alternative structure with better potential of biological activity. Now, if we want to see the steps of QSR model development, it will have a four main stages, data preparation, processing, prediction and validation, and interpretation. Now, as I've mentioned that it is a ligand-based approach, so we have to start with the chemical structure representation of the training set compounds. And the response values for biological QSR are usually taken in a log scale. Now, why log scale? Now you know the dose response curve. Dose response curve is actually a parabolic in nature. But if you take log dose response curve, that becomes sigmoidal, and the middle portion becomes linear, which is easier to model. So in uh, uh, that is, uh, if you see the evolution of QAs here, that actually evolved from uh, modeling uh, property values, then it was extended to activity, and initially it was restricted to physiochemical property. And initially the linear modeling was tried, and uh, that was the uh, main uh, notion, that was the main notion of the original form of QSR. And uh, uh, that's why the biological activity is taken in the log scale. And there are additional statistical uh, reasons also, now, if you do not take uh, biological activity values in log scale, it will be, uh, it will span over uh, uh, thousand and or ten thousand uh, uh, unit of uh, molar concentration. But if you take in the log scale, it becomes uh, say four or five log unit. Now, the uh, different metrics which are used for uh, judging the quality and predictive ability of a model are based on R square based metrics. And R square based metrics are actually dependent on the distance of individual observed values from the mean of the range of the uh, response of the training set compounds. Now, if you do not convert the biological activity values in the log scale, so that difference will be very high. And in that case, the R square and Q square values will have a bias towards higher value. We will always get higher value. So that's why the biological activity value should be converted to log scale. And the scale version will give you the appropriate picture of the quality of the model in terms of R square based metrics. Now, as I mentioned, you start with the chemical structure, then you compute a descriptor using appropriate algorithm, and you prepare your QSF table. You can uh, do your data curation, you can do your uh, descriptor theming. And then, after the data pretreatment, that is removal of intercorrelated variables and uh, redundant variables, then what you have to do, you have to divide the data set into training and test. Now, as I already mentioned, that training set compounds are used for development of the model. This is used for learning purpose. And once you develop the model, that model can be used to predict the test set chemicals, which have not been used for model development, but you have the observed or experimental values for tested compounds. 
uh, which can help to judge the predictability of the model that has been developed. But while applying this uh, model for the test set chemicals, you have to check for applicability domain, as I've already mentioned. Now, uh, there are different methods of uh, uh, judging the quality and uh, predictability of the uh, model. And uh, to judge the predictability of the model developed, one can apply different validation uh, tools, so which may be internal and external. I'll come into details about that. And finally, once your model is validated and is able to predict new set of chemicals, you can go for interpretation of the result and that, that can uh, guide uh, to design new chemicals. Now, there are diverse application areas of QVSS, starting from drug design, where it can be used to model biological activity. It can also be used to model different ADMET parameters, uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination parameters. For example, say, the CACO2 cell permeability or some volume of distribution or some uh, cytochrome uh, P450 met, uh, metabolism enzyme inhibition or some C clearance value. So all those can be modeled in that, uh, within the concept of QSR. QSR can also be used in material science for fine tuning of property, uh, for enhanced operation selectivity and optimized process efficiency. And QSR can be used for computational toxicology. Especially, it can be used for ecotoxicity uh, prediction. That means effect of chemicals on uh, different environmental species, the chemicals which are not being uh, consumed by human, uh, but it it are uh, these are being used industrially, or they are present in the environment. Maybe in the trace amount also, uh, maybe mixed. Uh, in water, surface water, they go to groundwater and come to river. Uh, they uh, can affect the different aquatic organisms, including fish. And then uh, human beings again consume those fish, and in which uh, some chemicals may be bar accumulated. So, such uh, persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals may have indirect effect on human bodies. Though the, uh, uh, the, the humans are not using or not consuming those chemicals directly, but indirectly from the environmental aspects, it may affect the human health. In addition, pharmaceuticals may be also considered uh, contaminants of emerging concern. Although pharmaceuticals are of our use for medicinal purposes to tackle diseases for better health, and uh, also the cosmetics we use for better lifestyle, but pharmaceuticals and cosmetics may be of environmental concern because uh, uh, the, the pharmaceuticals and uh, cosmetics may mix with wastewater and wastewater treatment uh, uh, methods may cannot uh, remove all organic matters. And this pharmaceutical and cosmetic product residues may mix with water and they can come uh, to surface water, ground water, then river water, and they can affect the aquatic health of different organisms. And uh, human bodies also can be affected in the indirect way, indirect way due to bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Now, uh, QSR is a method where we can use uh, data experimental data from a limited number of chemicals. Uh, experimental data uh, were, uh, for limited number of chemicals, and we develop the model, and then the model can be used to predict a large number of chemicals, and thus it can bypass experimental testing of a large number of chemicals. Only a selected number of chemicals which have been prioritized uh, can be subjected to experimental testing. In that way, we can save uh, time, manpower, and cost. So QSR can be used for identification, optimization of lead. It can be used for prioritization of chemical. Reduction of animal experimentation is very important. Economic and time saving, exploring mechanism of action, risk assessment of chemicals, and for sustainable chemical operation. Now, so far as drug discovery is concerned, QSR has been used in medicinal chemistry for a long time. Now, nowadays, QSR is, is used along with other 
molecular modeling uh, techniques, uh, other uh, ligand-based and structure-based techniques for drug design purpose. Now, if we see the drug uh, discovery pipeline is a long process. It starts with the discovery and uh, uh, development stages. As you know, the target selection, lead finding, lead optimization, then finding route of administration, pharmacological profiling, then comes preclinical research. That means before applying to human. So the compound is synthesized, purified, formulation is developed, toxicity testing in animals in vivo and in vitro, both short term and long term. Then it is ready for investigation, new drug application with the animal study data, manufacturing information, drug completion, and clinical protocol. And then it can go for clinical research in phase one, phase two, and phase three, requiring a long time. And then uh, there may be the new drug application. And even after uh, approval of a new drug, uh, the uh, trial continues in phase four also. So as you can see, this is a long process and requiring huge amount of money, manpower, and time. So there should be some method which can increase the probability of success. Because uh, out of 10,000 compounds, one compound may see the uh, that is the clinic uh, at the end. So the 9, 9, uh, 999 compounds will fail. So it is better to fail early in the drug discovery pipeline instead of uh, finding uh, a, a compound failing at the late stage because um, more late it is, uh, high, higher the cost involved. So we have to see that uh, a compound uh, which has less potential to be a drug should be eliminated early from the drug discovery pipeline. And QSR can help here, especially if you start with the ADMET. Nowadays, the ADMET pattern is uh, checked at the beginning, even before synthesizing a compound. So before synthesis of compound, you cannot see it experimentally. So ADMET models will help you whether the ADMET pattern of a compound uh, will be good or bad. So depending on that, you can proceed or do not proceed. There are several examples of successful application of QSR uh, along with other bonding techniques like uh, Zanamigvir in influenza, Tyrofi-1 in thrombosis, Imatinib in cancer, Raltigravir in AIDS, Donepezil in Alzheimer's disease, Bosepivir, hepatitis C, Norfloxacin, bacterial infection, and so on. It is not that only QSR has been applied in uh, this uh, discovery, but along with other molecular modeling techniques, QSL has also been used to develop these compounds. I've already mentioned that QSL has a great role in identification of chemical hazard from the environmental point of view, because you know the industrially we are using so many chemicals and uh, new chemicals are coming to the uh, market at very high pace. And there are so many endpoints, environmental endpoints, we do not have infrastructure to have the, the environmental experimental values for all these chemicals, for all the endpoints. So that is actually impossible. So we have to use some kind of modeling approach to know what will be the risk uh, potential of a compound or some uh, risk assessment value of a compound uh, for different environmental endpoints. And aquatic toxicology has a uh, great uh, 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 role to play in such uh, predictions. And different organisms, like I say, Daphnia and uh, some Tetrahymena and different fish species are used to evaluate uh, uh, the uh, environmental toxicity pattern of uh, chemicals. And we can develop different models. And then these models can be used for prediction of uh, toxicity pattern of the chemicals, which then can be used for prioritization of chemicals. If a compound uh, have high, higher uh, uh, potential to be toxic, we can actually go for uh, experimental testing to see whether it is really toxic or not. And here the toxicity testing may also include some toxicity like semutogenicity, carcinogenicity and all. And actually, very, uh, for very uh, less number of compounds, less than 1% compound, we have adequate data uh, for different environmental endpoints. So with the ever-increasing production of new chemicals and rising cost of experimental testing, 
different environmental uh, agencies are actually as, uh, suggesting the use of QSR for uh, prediction of values of, of their environmental toxicity. Here we can actually mention about US EPA, uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency, which has uh, long been using QSR for uh, uh, toxicity assessment, and also European Commission's Scientific Committee on Toxicity, Ecotoxicity, and Environment, especially in view of the REACH regulation, which has been implemented from 2007 in the European Union, uh, the QSR derived data, toxicity data, are also uh, uh, useful and they are acceptable as a replacement of environmental uh, experimental data or when the data are not available. So due to shortage of uh, experimental data, QSR estimates for the selection of persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic substances appear an attractive alternative. So I've already mentioned that QSR can also be used to explore mechanistic aspect of toxic action. So due to increasing requirement of alternative methods, the alternative methods uh, include uh, uh, in vitro methods, um, uh, in across is actually a method uh, which is uh, uh, like a local QSA type it is based on the similarity approach based on uh, similarity of query chemical to uh, some chemicals having uh, known experimental values we can uh, guess uh, the toxicity pattern of the query chemical so read across is also very popular in environmental chemistry and regulatory toxicology So QSR will be time and cost effective, avoids animal experimentation, supports three R principles, that is replacements, reduction, and refinement of animal experimentation, and supported by various organizations like KCVM, uh, International Organization of Medical Sciences, Rich Regulation, and OECD. In predictive toxicology, there are several endpoints, like say inhalational toxicity, genotoxicity, nephrotoxicity, development toxicity, dermal toxicity, carcinogenicity, eye irritation, skin toxicity, etc. For material science, we may use different kinds of materials, so ceramics, biomaterials, fullerenes, carbon nanotubes, uh, for developing model, uh, mo uh, models for their uh, different endpoints, different properties. Okay, so starting from chemical structure, we compute descriptors, we develop gives a model, then we apply uh, appropriate statistical methods, we develop QSA, models and then we can use it for interpretation validation and prediction purpose. Now if we see the history of QSR uh, development, uh, it actually started, the concept started long back, uh, uh, as back in 1868 uh, uh, in the time of Trump, Brown and Frieza. So they applied it uh, for the uh, physiological action of stricting derivatives can be mathematically correlated to the chemical constitution. So at that time, QSR was not uh, in their original form, but the concept was there that the physiological action of the stricten derivatives dependent on chemical constitution. That means biological activity is a function of chemical structure. Then in 1899, Mayer and Overton, uh, they uh, correlated a narcotic potency with olive oil water partition coefficient. Then in 1935, Hammett, we applied uh, uh, the, this uh, modeling approach to model uh, reaction rate or iron addition of substituted benzoic acid with the uh, substituent constant that is Hammett electronic parameter. So that is actually the, uh, the first mathematical algorithm of QSPR, I would say, I would say QSPR, because initially it was applied in physical organic chemistry. Initially it was not applied in biological system. It actually evolved from physical organic chemistry through Hammett. And later it was extended to the biological system by Hansch in 1962, 
who applied this concept to plant growth regulator and he uh, introduced the concept of PAL, that is hydrophobic uh, subterranean constant in analogy to Hammett equation. At the same time, in uh, 1962, Free Wilson developed mathematical model, which is also called de novo model, which is actually uh, based on the assumption that the con uh, contribution of the biological activity uh, by, uh, by different uh, uh, substituents uh, can be modeled, and the presence or absence of different substituents are considered in the form of binary variable, and one can develop them. Later in the 70s, uh, Randy and then Kieran Hall they develop different branch units considering two-dimensional representation of molecular structure and their uh, topological descriptors are very famous and uh, it is uh, used uh, widely and later they also developed electrotopological state atom index and kappa shape index then in 1988 Kramer made a big breakthrough he actually started uh, 3d qsr in the form of comparative molecular field analysis where you use this field uh, descriptors, uh, static and electrostatic descriptors for development of the model. And later it was also extended to COMSIA, comparative molecular similarity and analysis, where the this uh, halogen bond donor acceptor and the hydrophobic features also considered. Now there have been uh, many advancements since then in 3D QSR formalisms and 1990s onwards we see the, that is a, a development in virtual screening studies, various ligand based and structure based approaches, including docking, etc. And uh, we uh, in the present day apply, use uh, various multi dimensional QSR like 4D, 5D, 6D, and 7D. Now, what are these different dimensional features? 0D means chemical formula derived, 1D means substructure fragment derived. 2D means graph theory derived based on two dimensional representation. 3D means uh, spatial geometry derived. 4D uh, based on conformation, orientation, and proportion state. 5D based on induced fit theory. 6D is 5D use a plus solvation condition applied. And 7D real target uh, receptor inf information is included. So QSR, along with other modeling strategies like pharmacophore. Database mining came from the approaches and the structure based approaches can be used to uh, develop design traps. In the environmental chemistry, usually QSR is used. Other approaches, like uh, say docking, is not uh, much used, but it can be used in some cases, provided that the receptor structure is known. Now we come back to QSR itself then. So as I mentioned, uh, it may be either regression based uh, or classification based. In regression based, uh, we can use simple multiple linear regression or more robust partial least squares. For classification, one can use discriminant and cluster analysis. Machine learning can again be regression based or classification based. And there are several examples like say artificial neural network, support vector machine, random forest, and so on. Now, if we are considering the biological QSR, then there are some requirements for uh, the endpoint data for biological QSR. The response point uh, that is being modeled should be the fixed uh, dose for fixed response time. That means it may be IC50, C50 time. And concentration should be measured in a molar unit. And molar concentration should be in, should have been converted to a log basis, that is log one by C, may also be called as PC. And there should be span, that is wide span of biological activity value uh, of uh, four to five log units providing, provided that you are doing regression-based QSR. And there should be sufficient data points uh, present, especially for multiple linear regression type uh, model, uh, which may not be much relevant for uh, machine learning, but for multiple linear regression, uh, one should have at least five is to one ratio for the number of data points to uh, number of descriptors. But in general, one you now the, the, the one statement can be given the number of descriptors in general should be low because more uh, number of descriptors you have, uh, uh, there is uh, higher uh, probability of getting it uh, over repeated model. Now, if we start with a simple multiple linear regression model, the model will look like this. Now, in this model, uh, you see the y that you can see in the left hand side of the equal to sign, uh, this is the response that we are going to model. 
And in the right hand side, you have several x descriptors. These are uh, x variables. These are actually descriptors or the information about molecular structure or property information, which you can find out uh, using some descriptor computing software. And uh, you can see this A1, A2, A3, these are actually regression coefficient uh, or uh, uh, the contribution of a particular descriptor to the response, which may be either positive or negative contribution. And based on the contribution value, you can find out how a particular feature is influencing your biological activity. Now, after you develop your model, if you apply this model for computation or prediction purpose, you will get the computed or predicted values, and then you will be able to uh, plot observed versus predicted values. And as I mentioned that for a good model, the difference between observed and predicted will be low. In that case, uh, you will get a, a scatter plot with a minimum degree of scatter uh, around the 45 degree angle line. So if a model is very bad, you will um, see that uh, the points are very much scattered because there is uh, that is quite a uh, wide uh, deviation between the observed and uh, uh, computed or predicted values. But for a good model, ideally all of them should be on the diagonal line, but that is, uh, there is no ideal case. So, so there will always be some degree of scatter. Even the biological activity values that you are using, as I've mentioned, this is EC50 or IC50 targets. So this will be mean plus minus standard error. And you know, in case of biological experiments, always there will be standard error. Standard error cannot be zero. So there will be standard error. So the value uh, of mean that you are going to uh, develop your model may not be the exact value. So that will be close to your exact value, but there may be some noise in your experimental values that you cannot find out. So there uh, are different metrics to judge the quality of a QSA model. Uh, like so, the first one is a determination coefficient. So as I've mentioned that the observed and calculated value, this difference should be low. But uh, for a regression model, if you take sum of all the residuals, you will get zero. But because there will be some positive residuals and some negative residuals, because both are of same, similar, uh, similar probability for uh, a uh, unbiased model. So you can take the squared residual. So that will be positive always. Now, if you take sum of squared residual, that should be minimum value. Now, how we can uh, compare the sum of squared residual with some reference? What is the difference here? We do not have any difference. So, uh, means reference uh, uh, known here. So, what you can, the best reference may be the mean, mean of the uh, response values for the training compounds. And obviously, the difference between the individual observed values to the mean will be high value. So this will be high, the denominator should be high and the uh, uh, numerator should be low value. So in ideal case, this, should be, this ratio should be close to zero. In that case, R square should be close to one. So R square should be a high value close to one. For a good model, R square may be say 0.9 or so. And uh, this uh, particular expression uh, doesn't tell anything about the number of descriptors used in the model. So you can derive your descriptor from say five model, five uh, derive your model from five descriptors or say from 10 descriptors. So a five descriptor model will always be better than 10 descriptor model, provided you have the same degree of R square. So you have to penalize the model for the number of descriptors. So that you can do using this uh, second expression that is explained variance using the number of descriptors in your expression. Then uh, you can use a variance ratio that shows the actually the uh, uh, confidence of R square that you are getting, and also that shows the stability of the different regression coefficient, overall stability. And you can also compute standard error of estimate. This should be a low value for a good model. But all these metrics do not say anything about the predictive ability of the model. They are only related to statistical quality of the model. For a classification-based model, we cannot use R square or Q square. Uh, R squared type of metrics, we have to go for sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, precision, uh, based on the true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative values. In March 2002, a meeting was held uh, uh, in Setubal, Portugal, to formulate a set of guidelines, which were later uh, modified uh, in 2004. 
So these are the five guidelines. Uh, there should be a defined endpoint. There should be a, an, an ambiguous algorithm, a defined domain of applicability, and appropriate measures of goodness of fit, robustness, and predictivity. And there should be a mechanistic interpretation if possible. Now, if you see, you want to see the user model development stages according to OECD guidelines. So the, according to OECD uh, guideline one, the data set chosen should be uh, 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 that is a defined one, defined endpoint. Uh, that means you cannot mix two different data sets with uh, different uh, uh, kind of experimental protocols. Then according to OECD principle two, you should have an unambiguous algorithm. Whatever you are doing, that is descriptor computation, then uh, descriptor thinning, uh, uh, pre-treatment, then descriptor, uh, uh, that is a division of the data set into training and test, the method of division, then which methods are uh, uh, use, you are using for training and test set generation. So all comes out OECD principle two. According to OECD principle four, there should be sufficient number of uh, metrics uh, uh, for judging the quality of the model, uh, like uh, uh, statistical quality measures and different hydration metrics. According to OECD principle three, there should be a defined uh, domain of applicability for your model. And the last one, OECD principle five, that uh, says us that uh, there should be a mechanistic interpretation if possible. Then there are some points that one should remember during QSR model development. The data should be homogeneous. As I've already mentioned, you cannot mix the two different data sets with two different experimental uh, protocols. Because if you are using two different experimental protocols, the same compound may have two different quantity values for the response. So that you cannot use for the same uh, data set for model generation. Then in the appropriate endpoint data, I have told that uh, in the endpoint data should be those for fixed response type, like IC50 or IC50. So you cannot use, say, milligram per kg type of response. Then usually collinear descriptors are avoided, incomprehensible descriptors are to be avoided because that do not give any mechanistic interpretation. Then error in descriptor values. Uh, you are using some descriptor computing software, and the, the value that you are give, uh, getting uh, you should check whether it is given the correct value or not, because it depends on the thing that whether the software can handle the features that you have in your compound. Say the compound contains some metal, which cannot be handled by the software, or uh, the particular kind of uh, uh, the representation of uh, structure that you are using, so particular tautomeric form that you are using, whether uh, it is consistent over all the data present in your data set. Because as you know, the keto and ultrafluorism, you, you are using in some compounds a compound as keto, in other compounds as enol, then the descriptor values will be different. So you have to use the consistent uh, structure representation for computation of descriptors. Then transferability of QSR. The model that you generate should be transferable to other groups also. They, are, they should be able to uh, reproduce the same model, provided you have given sufficient details of model generation. Then you have excessive number of descriptors should be avoided to avoid overfitting. Lack of inadequate statistics should be avoided. Incorrect calculation should be avoided. Uh, lack of descriptor autoscaling. Sometimes um, some people may uh, uh, opine on the contribution of different features based on some uh, regression coefficient values. But remember that if the uh, model has been generated from uh, non-scaled descriptors, then you cannot do that from the regression coefficient values. You have to standardize the values, the descriptor values, to have the relative contribution of different descriptors. Then misuse or misinterpretation of statistics, because usually uh, QSM models are generated by non-mathematicians. So misuse or misinterpretation of statistics should be avoided. Consideration of distribution of residuals this is a very uh, much important. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, good diagnostic value regarding the model. Then inadequate training test selection. So you cannot use very less number of components in test set. Say you are using only say five compounds in test set and rest 95 components in the training set. That is not desired. You should have sufficient number of components in the test set so that you can judge the predictability of the component model. Then failure to validate a QSA or QSP correctly and mechanistic interpretation should be present. Any QSA model should 
to be actually uh, able to uh, predict for new set of chemicals and that is the real application of QS uh, uh, because it, the QSA models are not uh, generated for application on the training set of data it is generated for application to new set of chemicals the chemicals that you have not uh, synthesized before synthesis you may have some idea about the particular property or toxicity or activity and based on that you can judge uh, you can uh, you can uh, 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 give you a decision whether you can go for synthesis and testing or and so variation strategies check the reliability of the role of model and one can do that using internal or external validation in case of internal validation this validation is done uh, based on the training set compounds only so that is done either by leave one out approach uh, that is if you can remove one compound in one, uh, one iteration and from the rest of the component, you develop the model and the omitted components predicted. And you uh, go on doing this in several iterations uh, uh, until you get the uh, lib one out predicted value for all the components. Or you can also do lib many out. You can uh, omit a portion of the training compounds and redevelop the model, and you can predict the omitted compounds. So you can do it in several iterations. Actually, there will be several possible combinations. And in uh, the, all those cases, you have the this metric Q squares so will look like actually R square, same similar expression. Only you have to use the leave one out or leave uh, many operated values. In case of external validation, you use a separate set of data, which may be the test data or completely external set, and you can predict uh, those compounds. And usually, external validation is considered as the gold standard in QSL literature. You can also do bootstrapping, which is based on sampling technique. And you can also do Y randomization, where you can randomize the Y column, keeping X uh, matrix intact and redevelop the model. Obviously, the random models will perform uh, worse than uh, the uh, real model. And then you may have some metric to compute to what is the contribution, what is the performance of the model uh, in case of randomization. So these are detailed here, as I've already mentioned, already explained that uh, internal validation is also termed as cross validation and you are using training set data and you can compute Q square or cross validated R square. And in case of uh, external validation, you are using a separate set of data, which are actually test set data. Uh, and you can calculate the metric R square pit now the question comes how you select your training compounds now one thing you should remember that qsl is based on the similarity principle that means the similar compounds will have similar kind of property so the query compounds should be should be similar to the training compounds so training compounds should be selected in such a manner that you can actually consider the most uh, uh, extent of diversity of the data set and the test compound should be close to at least one or more number of compounds in the training set. Otherwise, the prediction will be unreliable. Now, selection of the training compound usually is done in a similarity-based uh, method. Uh, there are several methods like uh, uh, self-organizing map or Kinnard stone or K-means clustering or sphere exclusion. But you can also use the random method also. But if you are using random method, then it is desirable to have uh, um, uh, many uh, uh, iterations uh, of random methods. And one can also go for sorted uh, response type of division. I already mentioned that the applicability domain is very much important to show the application of a model for prediction of new set of compounds, uh, which is actually uh, obtained from different methods. Uh, one important method is leverage approach. Leverage is actually based on the hat uh, matrix uh, that gives uh, the diagonal element gives uh, the hat values and one can compute this uh, uh, the hat values from this expression and uh, and the compounds having the uh, leverage uh, values uh, higher than the uh, some uh, critical value which is actually this one 3p by 1 to n 3p by n where P is the number of model variables plus one, and N is the number of objects. Uh, if it is more than that, then you can say that the compound is actually outside 
applicable domain. And if the cross validated standardized residual is greater than three standard deviation, then the compound is called the response outlier. Now, there has been a great degree of debate between internal and external validation. We are not going into that. We, are, uh, we can only uh, suggest that both internal and external validation is important. Internal validation shows the internal robustness of the model based on the training set compounds, and external validation is important to show the reliability of the model on unseen data. In general, external validation has been considered as the conclusive proof. But in some cases, truly external data may not be available. And in those cases, we divide our data set into two parts, training and test. Now we'll go to the, the tools uh, which are available from our uh, laboratory in our web page. These are the web pages uh, mentioned uh, uh, from where different tools uh, can be downloaded free of cost. I'll mention some of the tools for QSL model development and validation purpose. Now, there are some uh, small, small tools uh, for doing some small operations like ML validation, data set division, uh, then external validation plus. External validation plus is uh, for doing the external validation metric calculation only. That means you can derive your model from any uh, any approach uh, uh, or any uh, uh, modeling software, but you need only the experimental and the predicted values uh, to calculate the external validation metrics, and you can use this tool. Then base subset selection, genetic algorithm, bias variance estimator. Okay, now I'll discuss uh, about uh, this tool, the AD using standardization approach. This uh, uh, method has been actually uh, uh, published in this particular uh, paper in Geometrics and Intelligent Laboratory Systems. This is based on the assumption that uh, there will be a normal distribution with respect to both the response and with respect to descriptor values also. And we know that uh, for a normal distribution, the mean plus minus three times standard deviation covers 99.9% of the population. And based on that theory, uh, here, uh, what we do, we uh, take all the uh, descriptors that are appearing in the model, and uh, we can standardize uh, those descriptor values for both training and test set compounds. You can standardize both uh, training and test set compounds for those descriptor values using this formula, mean uh, that is a value, descriptor value minus mean divided by standard deviation. And the standardized values, and then we can check the standardized values whether it is less than three. If all, if all the values are less than three, then we can say that all the descriptor values for all query compounds are less than three. So all these query compounds will be inside the domain because they are similar to the training set compounds. Now, if all of them are more than three, then you can say these compounds are actually outside the applicability domain. Now, the problem comes when some of the descriptors, uh, the standardized values are less than three and some are some of them are more than three, then we can apply, uh, calculate the z-score uh, based on this one. Uh, that is the mean of this is values plus 1.28 into the standard deviation. And if this value is more than three, then we'll say that the, the, the compound is outside domain is less than three. Uh, then we say that it's inside domain. So this is one approach. This is a simple approach, and this works quite fine, similar to the leverage approach. Then double cross-validation. Uh, this is published in Geometric and Intelligent Liberty System in 2016. So this is the uh, uh, approach uh, method where you know uh, in the uh, case of uh, uh, QSAR model uh, development, we uh, divide the data set into training and test, and training set is used to develop the model. But uh, the training set composition is fixed, so the descriptor that we are choosing for model development may be biased. So what we can do, we can stratify the training set in k-fold uh, cross-validation. We can develop k-calibration set and k-validation set. And we can develop k-models from this k-validation set. 
So the bias in descriptor selection can be avoided and these K models can be used for prediction of the K variation set. So <clears throat> this will be actually the internal loop. And the outer loop is this test set. So in internal loop, with the, the, which uh, helps us in selection of the model or descriptor combination. So which model we uh, choose, uh, we can choose it uh, from the least uh, mean absolute error of the validation set, or we can choose it uh, based on uh, some top model, uh, based on consensus predictions. Now, what is consensus prediction? Consensus predictions means we are using more than one model. Instead of using individual model, one can use multiple models and one can uh, calculate the consensus predictions and consensus predictions are always preferred to the individual models because in consensus predictions, uh, the activity domain will be wider. We are actually uh, considering different hypotheses uh, characterizing different models and we can nullify the problem of a particular model using consensus model. Or we can uh, use uh, the best descriptor combination of some uh, top model. So there, there are different ways. What we can use one of the several ways to uh, select the best descriptor combination of optimal model. And then this optimal model is used for prediction of the test components. So this is uh, the, the uh, theory of double cross validation, which is which has been implemented in this particular uh, tool. Next one is the intelligent consensus predictor. I have mentioned that consensus predictions uh, are always preferred than the individual one uh, because uh, the individual model may have some problem for particular uh, particular uh, uh, query compound or it may have a uh, limited uh, or narrow uh, domain of applicability. So when we are using consensus uh, models, that means uh, you are using more number of descriptors. So you are using more number of more amount of information. So that is always preferred. Now the consensus prediction can be done in the usual way just by averaging. If you take average of several models that gives you the average prediction or consensus prediction. But one can also use some intelligent version of uh, consensus prediction. And for that we have defined some uh, qualified model. So in uh, computation of the consensus prediction we are not using all the model derived predictions. We are using only the qualified models. And for the qualified models what do we do for each query a chemical, we identify the 10 most close training set compound. For each query chemical, we select 10 most close training compound based on the equilibrium distance scope. And uh, we, uh, we calculate uh, uh, leave one out prediction for those uh, uh, training comp uh, compounds. Uh, and we calculate uh, the mean uh, cross validated error for those 10 compounds. And uh, if we are using multiple models, so we'll have this uh, mean uh, cross validated error uh, of the 10 uh, close 10 compounds uh, for each query compound. And in that way, we will be able to identify the model which is showing the, uh, uh, which, which will be, which will be uh, showing the lowest, uh, uh, lowest uh, value of the cross validated error. But the, the first version, that is the CM1, we are using actually average of all those models, all those qualified models. Now, when a model become disqualified, now when we are uh, searching for um, 10 most close compounds, then we are imposing another criteria that these 10 compounds should be within some threshold of distance from the query chemical. What is that? That particular uh, threshold is the mean uh, equilibrium distance, uh, mean uh, standardized equilibrium distance among the training compound plus three times standard deviation. Mean uh, uh, equilibrium distance, mean standardized equilibrium distance among the training compounds plus three times standard deviation. That is the threshold. So if the uh, distance between uh, uh, equality compound and the training compound is not within that range, that particular training compound is not considered. And in that way, if you do not find at least three compounds which are close enough to a particular query compound, then that particular model is not suitable for that query compound and that particular model is disqualified. So in the consensus prediction, we use only those uh, models which are qualified based on this criteria. 
In case of CM2, we use weighted average predictions. As I've already mentioned that we have used uh, calculated cross-validated error, cross-mean cross-validated error uh, for uh, the, the all 10 uh, closed compounds uh, for different models. And from that, we can actually um, give some weightage to individual models. And uh, based on that weightage, that means uh, the model showing higher error will have lower weightage. And in that way, we can uh, uh, change the weightage of different models and we can compute the uh, predicted value for the query compound. And the third version, that is best, best selection of prediction, we use the model, uh, model query compound wise. That means for query compound one, maybe the third model is best but for query compound two maybe the fifth model is best so based on the cross validated error for the closest 10 compounds uh, we are choosing individual models for individual query compounding and that way we are not using same model for all query compounds we are using different models for different query compounds and fin finally we are calculating the uh, the consensus prediction based on uh, different different model derived prediction for different query compounds and we can also impose different additional criteria like equilibrium distance cutoff. You can also apply here applicable domain concept and we can apply here Dixon Q test uh, to remove prediction out there. And finally, uh, we can have this prediction CM1, CM2, CM3, that is uh, these three predictions, intelligent consensus predictions. And it has been seen that uh, in many cases, the CM2 and CM3 actually outperform the uh, individual models and also the uh, ordinary consensus predictions. That has been shown in uh, in the publication that has been mentioned here, that is Journal of Chemometrics in 2018. Next one is prediction reliability indicator. That is uh, uh, mainly applicable for multiple linear regression model. So when we are applying some MLR model for prediction of new query chemical, we are getting some value. But we have to know what is the uh, reliability of prediction that we are looking. So we have uh, developed this tool based on some criteria. Okay, so these are the three criteria. One is uh, the scoring based on mean absolute error of the closest 10 training compounds. As I've already mentioned that for each query compound, we can choose a closest 10 query compound based on equilibrium distance score. And we then can see the performance of the model in leave one of prediction of those closest 10 compounds. And based on that, we can group some score. That means how the model performs well for the similar compounds in the training set. Second criteria is based on the applicability domain whether the query compound is based within the applicability domain or not. Here we have used the standardization approach for uh, determining the applicability domain. And the third one is uh, based on uh, the proximity uh, of the observed uh, response mean, uh, proximity of the predicted value for, uh, to the observed response mean. Because any regression for any regression based pro uh, problem, it has been seen that the uh, data points which are close to the uh, training set mean, they are actually uh, can be better uh, modeled or better predicted by the uh, model developed. So performance of the model will be better for those chemicals which are close to the training segment. So based on this concept, we have the three criteria and then we can change the weighted value. So we have the W1, W2, W3 weighted. We can change it. We can change it uh, in a systematic way and we can find out which one is the, uh, the optimum weighted. And it, we have seen that in many cases, we got 0.5, 0 0.5, this way it is 0.5 for the first one, 0 for the second one, and 0.5 for the third one. And so why 0 for the uh, middle one, that's accurate domain. Although accurate domain is important, but as we are already considering the performance of the model for the closed uh, 10 uh, training compounds. So the concept of accurate domain is some way uh, 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 already included in past criteria. So if we also omit this one, there is no problem. So the 0.5 for the first criterion and 0.5 for the uh, third criterion. And from that, we can have the composite score. Now, if the composite score is three, that gives good prediction, two moderate prediction, and one for 
uh, poor or unreliable prediction. This we have sh shown in this particular paper in Omega in 2018. Now, uh, next I'll discuss about the uh, problem of QSL model building from small data set. You know that uh, a model data set should be divided into training and test set. But if we have a low number of data points in our data set, then it is difficult to divide the data set into training and test. Because uh, if we remove some compounds as test set, we are losing some information. We cannot use those information for model building. So that is one problem. And second thing is that if we have a limited number of compounds in the training set, then we can select only limited number of descriptors, especially in case of NLR. So we are the model will have less number of features that may not explain the response very well. So it is better to go for consensus prediction. So to deal with these problems, we have developed a tool that is for a small data set modeler. Here we are applying two methods. One is double cross validation that I have already mentioned. And second thing is the consensus predictions. So as I've already mentioned, double cross validation that uh, well, the, well, we can use uh, uh, the whole training set and we can uh, actually do the uh, n fold uh, cross validation. So we may divide this data set into n calibration and n validation set. And then we can select the descriptors uh, for different uh, in, uh, calibration sets. And uh, we can see the performance of those models for the validation set. And then we can select the model. So this is for the double cross validation. And uh, the consensus prediction where we can use more than one model and we can use more uh, number of features. So we can also apply the concept of uh, this consensus predictions in our algorithm. Before we go for uh, uh, the small data set modeler, we have to curate the data set also, because if you have a small data set and if there is problem in your data set, that then it will have high impact on your model, actually, because as such your data set is small and uh, it may contain some errors, so the impact of it will be higher. So common error identified during manual cleaning may be the structure is wrong, normalization of bond is incomplete, some duplicates may be present, and other possibilities are wrong charges, presence of expressed hydrogen in a hydrogen depleted graph, incorrect bonds, etc. So this is a, uh, the nine workflow which can be used uh, for curation. Uh, usually in case of uh, uh, biological QSA, we uh, do not use uh, the inorganic uh, um, compounds, inorganic, um, say metal containing compounds, or some um, uh, compounds containing inorganic residues. We usually do not use salts, so we do not usually use mixtures. So there are different nodes for element filter, connectivity, and salt stripper, and then optimized geometry and uh, the structure normalizer. And finally, uh, uh, this hydrogen bond addition, and we have the, this final, with the SDF writer, the final set of curated molecules. And using these curated molecules, we can apply a series of uh, operations like duplicate analysis, structural outliers removed, uh, response outliers removed, and activity clip analysis. Now, duplicate analysis means that uh, the same compound may be present in the data set in two different names. So that is not actually uh, uh, desired. So we have to identify duplicate. And if both are of same experimental values, we can keep any one. But if they are of different uh, values, then we have to exclude. If they are quite different, then we have to exclude. Then we have to uh, also uh, identify response range outlier. But some of the compounds may have response values that is quite different from the rest of the compounds. In such cases, we have to remove the, some com these compounds because these will be very influential observations. And in a small data set, they will highly uh, influence your model development. So such uh, outlier should be removed. Uh, here we have used this mean plus minus uh, k times standard deviation by default k is three for removal of response outlier. Similarly, the structural outlier should be removed using mean plus k times standard deviation of the Euclidean distance scores. Then activity clip determination. Activity clip means two compounds are having similar structure but they are quite different in terms of activity. So uh, this will be difficult to model. So there should be some way to uh, differentiate this, uh, to identify this. 
and accordingly their uh, uh, appropriate action is taken. Here, actually, we have a, a strategy, different strategy for uh, determination of activity cliffs. Now, that depends on the number of uh, number of uh, similar compounds. For a query com chemical, if the number of uh, similar compounds uh, are three or more than three, then we have one criteria. If it is two, then another criteria. I mean, it's one, then another criteria. What are the criteria? If these are more than three, three or more than three, then what we do, we uh, calculate the mean of the similar compounds and we see the difference between mean and the response of the query. And if it is more than threshold, threshold is one log unit and corresponding uh, T value is significant at 95% level, then that particular compound may be considered as activity T. If the number of similar compounds is two, then what we do, we see the difference between mean of similar compounds and response of query chemical. If it is more than the threshold, that is default is one. And if the difference is more than the difference between two response uh, of the uh, similar compounds, then there is a possibility that the query compound is an activity clear. In the third case, when we have only one similar compound, then we can just see the difference between them. And if it's more than one, there is possibility that there is a, an activity clear. So we are actually incorporating all of these in our small data set modeler. We are doing this uh, cross validation. So say we have n number of compounds, curated compounds, then we take R number of compounds in each validation set, and uh, we have a K validation uh, calibration sets and K validation sets. We develop K models, uh, either by MLR or PLS, and we select the best model from different criteria. It may be based on the least MA value for the validation set, least MA value for the modeling set. It may be based on the highest Q square leaf uh, uh, many out for the modeling set. It is maybe based on the pooled uh, descriptors from the top three models based on the least MA value of the validation set, or it, this may be based on uh, consensus models, um, simple average and weighted average ratio. So there are several options. So one may choose any one of them in small data set model. So actually, we are generating several combinations uh, here in, the, in our inner loop of double cross validation. And finally, we are also applying uh, this across, that is the consensus modeling approach. And then we are actually calculating our different metrics as we do in our uh, usual QSR uh, for comparison. And uh, for selection of the model, you always prefer the error-based criteria uh, like mean absolute error. Uh, and we use ME 95%, ME for based on the 95% after removal of 5% of high residual chemicals. Why ME and why ME 95%? Um, that uh, I can't discuss in detail here because of uh, uh, lack of time. So these are the, uh, the GUI of a small data set uh, curate, curator and small data set modeler. And this paper is published in Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling in 2019. Now this is a recent addition to our uh, tools. Uh, this is DTC QSR, this complete QSR package. And we have several smaller tools uh, for doing several uh, QSR related operations like say, MLR model development and validation or external validation class or base subset selection or bias variance estimation, et cetera. Those are small sort of tools, but, uh, but uh, this tool can uh, do the, the whole operation in one go. That is uh, actually for either regression-based uh, model development or classification-based model development. And it uses genetic algorithm and base subset selection for variable selection. One can do MLR, LDA, random forest. And uh, applicable domain uh, is included. It performs wide animation tests. It can generate uh, response. Uh, there is scattered plot and is real plot and ROC plot for LDA. And it can screen and, or predict uh, for, for new variables. So this is a, a new addition to our uh, website and the website is given here, uh, shown here, and the different tools uh, uh, can be downloaded free of cost. Uh, Java must be installed in your computer to run the uh, Java files. And uh, if uh, anybody has any problem, uh, one can see this page uh, uh, frequently asked questions, and there is a form also if one encounters any problem uh, in running some uh, program or tool. One can ask uh, with the screenshot of problem and uh, you receive answer from us. I'm showing again the 
uh, websites from where one can download these programs. So we acknowledge uh, the financial uh, help and funding from different uh, organizations over the time. And these are some of the books uh, related to QSR for beginners. This is uh, from Elsevier, Academic Press. This is, uh, this is specially recommended for the beginners and, and this is a uh, brief version of QSR uh, for those who need uh, the idea of QSR very small time. This is a reference book, QSR in Drug Design, Predictive Toxicology and Risk Assessment. And this and the reference book, Advances in QSR Modeling from Springer. These are some specialized areas like in Alzheimer's disease, uh, multi-target drug design, in silico drug design for drug repurposing and for ecotoxicological QSR. And these are the two uh, new uh, titles are coming in silico modeling of drugs against coronaviruses. This is uh, this is very timely, uh, as you know. And the other is chemometrics and chem informatics in aquatic toxicology. So those who are interested can go through this book, but last two books are not yet published. 